In the last lecture, we began to look at some of the earliest surviving gospel accounts of Jesus' life that did not make it into the New Testament. We saw that, by and large, these other gospels are late and legendary, dating from the 2nd to the 8th centuries, and filled with traditions about Jesus that cannot be accepted as historically trustworthy. This is true of even the earliest among them, which would include the infancy gospel of Thomas, an account of Jesus as a miracle-working but mischievous young boy, and the gospel of Peter, a narrative of his trial, death, and resurrection. Books like this can be entertaining reading and, on the more serious side, can provide us with some insights into how Christians in later periods were attempting to understand Jesus. But they are of little value as historical sources for what Jesus himself really said and did. They're far too removed from the time of his life, too full of pious fiction, and for the most part too dependent on the Gospels of the New Testament. There is one other Gospel, though, that is very early, and that was, in the judgment of a number of scholars, produced independently of the New Testament Gospels. Some scholars have argued, in fact, that it contains historically authentic material from Jesus that survives nowhere else. Some have gone even further and called it the Fifth Gospel. This is the now famous Coptic Gospel of Thomas, one of the most significant archaeological discoveries of the 20th century, without a question the most significant book from early Christianity uncovered in modern times. The discovery of the Gospel of Thomas makes for a fascinating story. It was not discovered in a carefully planned archaeological dig, but by pure serendipity. An Egyptian Bedouin, who was named, uh, remarkably enough, Muhammad Ali, was digging for fertilizer with his brothers near the village of Nag Hammadi in Egypt, where he accidentally came upon an earthenware jar buried beside a boulder. At first, uh, Muhammad Ali and his brothers were reluctant to open up the jar, fearing that there might be an evil genie inside, but After some reflection, they thought there might also be gold within, and so they smashed it to smithereens, uh, only to find not gold, but simply some old books, 13 leather-bound volumes, which uh, Muhammad Ali then took home and uh, stored in his home next to the stove. Uh, Reportedly, his mother that evening used several of the pages from these books to start the fire for the evening. Because Muhammad Ali was under suspicion of a violent murder in the neighborhood, uh, of which, in fact, he was evidently guilty, and he was afraid that his house would be searched for clues about the murder and that these books might be confiscated by the authorities, he gave them over to a local priest for safekeeping. Eventually, word got out about the discovery Antiquities dealers bought the volumes, scholars came to hear of their existence, and then managed to gather them together, read them, edit them, translate them, and publish them. They are now widely available in English as the Nag Hammadi Library, named after the village near which they were discovered. You can find a a copy of these books in English translation in lots of good used bookstores. Uh, They are widely available. The library, as it's called, consists then of these 13 leather-bound volumes of books. The volumes themselves contain a number of writings within them. In other words, they're anthologies. Altogether, there are 52 separate writings found in these volumes. The books are written on papyrus, an ancient writing surface that's much like paper that was manufactured out of papyrus reeds that were grown principally in Egypt around the Nile. The books that Muhammad Ali discovered were themselves produced in the mid-4th century A.D. We know when they were produced because whoever made them used uh, used 
paper scraps to uh, strengthen the bindings of these books. And some of these, the scrap paper has uh, have dates uh, written on them, and so we, we know when the volumes themselves were produced. But the, the date of the production of the volume doesn't tell us very much about the date of the writings found within the volumes, uh, because... Uh, of course, the the writings were produced much earlier. They were simply produced into books in the mid-fourth century. When were the 52 writings produced? Well, they were produced at different times, but we have good reason for thinking that many of these writings were produced as early as the second century A.D., since some of these are mentioned by church fathers living then who opposed these writings. And so the writings themselves, second century, the books in which they're found, produced in the fourth century. These books are all written in Coptic. Coptic is an ancient Egyptian language, um, even though the books were not originally written in Coptic. These are Coptic translations of Greek originals. We know this because these books were known to Greek authors who read Greek, and also we found fragments of some of these writings in, um, uh, in other places which uh, were produced in Greek. The most famous books of the collection, of course, is uh, the Gospel of Thomas. Some scholars date its text as early as the first century A.D., that is, from around the time or even before the writing of the Gospels of the New Testament. Most scholars, though, uh, don't date it quite that early, but prefer a date uh, sometime in the second century, but probably within the first half of the second century. There are different kinds of texts represented in the Nag Hammadi Library. Some, like the Gospel of Thomas, are Gospel accounts, with very peculiar understandings of Jesus and his teachings, peculiar from the perspective of those who know the New Testament gospel. Gospels. These uh, understandings found in the Nag Hammadi Library are rooted in an ancient form of Gnosticism, which I'll explain later in this lecture. Among these are Gospels allegedly written by Jesus' disciple, uh, Jesus disciple Philip and his female companion Mary. Other texts within the collection represent mythological reflections on how the world began, uh, the material world that we inhabit. Sometimes these come in the form of revelations of divine truth to a human prophet or a holy man. Others of these books appear to represent mystical poems that celebrate the true nature of the spiritual world. We don't know who buried these volumes out in the wilderness next to a boulder or why. But the burial place was near an ancient monastery. Most scholars think that probably what happened is that a 4th century monk from the monastery removed the books from the monastery library. He may have considered the books heretical and wanted to get rid of them. But if that were the case, one would have thought that he would have simply destroyed them by burning or some other method. It's more likely, then, that the monk who buried the books wanted to keep them safe until they were again permitted to be read by authorities who had prescribed the use of heretical texts. It's probably not an accident that around this time, the powerful bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, who had jurisdiction over this area, a man named Athanasius, made an official statement to his churches concerning which books could be read in the churches and which ones could not. This was a statement he made in a letter that he wrote in 367 A.D., right uh, after these uh, books were manufactured. Possibly the books then were buried in anticipation that later the tide of theological opinion would shift. But, as that never happened, they remained in the ground until 1945, when Muhammad Ali and his brothers just happened to be in search of good fertilizer. This would mean, then, that whoever buried the books probably considered them to be sacred in some sense, possibly even sacred scripture. This is particularly striking because most of the books are clearly Gnostic in form. Gnostic, uh, which is a, Gnosticism is a form of Christianity that 
came to be widely seen and condemned as heretical. Before I describe the nature of the Gnostic religion, I should give a brief description of the Gospel of Thomas itself. Unlike the Gospel of Peter that I talked about in the last lecture, which was discovered 60 years earlier, this particular Gospel is completely preserved. We have it intact. And yet, it has no narrative at all. This is what I called in the earlier lecture a sayings Gospel. There are no stories about anything that Jesus did, no references here even to his death and resurrection. The Gospel of Thomas is a collection of 114 sayings of Jesus. The sayings are not arranged in any recognizable order, nor are they set within any context, except in a few instances where, uh, in which Jesus is said to reply to a direct question of one of his disciples. Most of the sayings simply begin with the words, Jesus said, and then you have the saying. In terms of genre, this book looks less like the New Testament Gospels and more like the book of Proverbs in the Hebrew Bible. Like Proverbs, it's a collection of sayings that are meant to bring wisdom to the one who can understand. In fact, the opening statement of the book indicates that the correct understanding of these sayings will provide more than wisdom. It will bring eternal life. The book begins with a statement of, uh, of what the character of the book is and a, uh, an indication of the significance of the words found in the book. It begins. Uh, I'm reading from the collection of texts uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is drawn from the English translation of the Nag Hammadi Library. These are the secret words which the living Jesus spoke and which Didymus, Judas, Thomas wrote down. And he said, whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. The correct interpretation of these sayings will lead to eternal life. The author of the book explicitly claims to be Didymus, Judas, Thomas. Both Didymus and Thomas are words that mean twin. Didymus is a Greek term. Uh, Thomas is a Semitic term. Judas is the man's proper name. According to the ancient Syrian writing called the Acts of Thomas, which I referred to in the previous lecture, this person, Didymus Judas Thomas, was actually a blood relation of Jesus, the one mentioned also in the New Testament in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. In other words, Didymus Judas Thomas was Jesus' twin brother. One way to think about this collection of sayings is to compare it with sayings we already know from the canonical Gospels. It's striking that many of the sayings in Thomas sound completely familiar to people who know the Gospels of the New Testament. Let me read you uh, several examples. Saying number 34, these num the, the sayings, by the way, are enumerated by uh, the modern editors of the text. In the manuscript itself, there aren't numbers associated with the verses, so these are the modern enumerations. Saying number 34, Jesus said, if a blind man leads a blind man, they will both fall into a pit. Okay? Blind leading the blind, like in the Synoptic Gospels. Or um, saying number 54, Jesus said, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Sounds like the Beatitudes in the Gospel of Luke. Or saying number 73, Jesus said, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Beseech the Lord, therefore, to send out laborers to the harvest. Again, sounds like the Gospels of the New Testament. Other sayings, though, sound vaguely familiar, but begin to sound somewhat peculiar. For example, the second saying in the collection. It starts off by sounding like something Jesus says in the New Testament. Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. Okay, well enough. But then he continues. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished, and he will rule over the all. He will rule over the all? What does that mean? Well, it's different from what you get in the New Testament Gospels. 
And there are other sayings that, in fact, sound quite unlike anything you find in the New Testament. Let me read you several examples. From saying 11, Jesus said, The dead are not alive, and the living will not die. On the day when you were one, you became two. But when you become two, what will you do? Well, that's somewhat puzzling. Or saying number 29, If the flesh came into being because of spirit, it's a wonder. But if spirit came into being because of the body, it's a wonder of wonders. Indeed, I'm amazed at how this great wealth has made its home in this poverty. Well, the meaning of that isn't altogether clear at first. Or take the preceding saying, 28. Jesus said, I took my place in the midst of the world, and I appeared to them in flesh. I found all of them intoxicated. I found none of them thirsty. And my soul became afflicted for the sons of men, because they are blind in their hearts and do not have sight. For empty they came into the world, and in empty too they seek to leave the world. But for the moment they are intoxicated. When they have shaken off their wine, then they will repent. Everyone's drunk, no one's thirsty. They have to get over their drunken stupor before they can repent. It's interesting. It's not found in the New Testament. Or, as a last uh, example, one of my favorite sayings in the Gospel of Thomas, the disciples said to Jesus, When will you become revealed to us, and when shall we see you? Sensible enough question. Jesus replies, When you disrobe without being ashamed, and take up your garments and place them under your feet like little children and tread on them, then you will see the Son of the Living One, and you will not be afraid. Wow. Well, what is that all about? The meaning of these sayings is uh, are the meanings of these sayings are in no way obvious. If they were obvious, they wouldn't be called the secret teachings of Jesus. They seem far less obscure, however, when understood in light of the basic religious perspective that was shared by various groups of Christians commonly called Gnostics. Here I need to take a brief detour to explain what the perspective of Gnostic Christians was. Gnosticism is a blanket term used by modern scholars to cover a wide range of religions that emerged in the world of the Mediterranean at about the same time as Christianity or slightly later. Scholars debate when Gnosticism emerged as a religious phenomenon. It certainly is around in the second century. Some scholars think that it's around during the time of Christianity or even earlier than Christianity, but it's a, it's a debated point. I'm calling it a blank, Gnosticism a blanket term because there are a lot of religious uh, phenomena that are categorized as Gnostic, but there are some basic uh, ideas that seem to be shared in common among various groups that are labeled uh, as Gnostics. Prior to the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library, we had to rely on what the Gnostics' opponents said about them to know what they stood for. That's never a very uh, reliable guide, uh, having to take what an, uh, an enemy says about you for, uh, to know what you yourself stand for. But in fact, that's all we had prior uh, to the Nag Hammadi Library, except for uh, a few texts that had been discovered earlier. A careful reading of some of the Gnostics' own texts, though, along with the comments of their enemies, can give us at least a basic idea of the uh, views of Gnostics. And so the, these are the views that seem to be shared widely among the various Gnostic groups. First, Gnostics believed that there was a radical disjuncture between the worlds of matter and spirit. Matter was thought to be inherently evil. Spirit was good. We live in a material world, but the material world itself is an evil place, not a good place. There were some people in the world who were themselves uh, comprised purely of matter. They, like all other animals, were destined for annihilation. And so there, there are people running around there who are, just, who are matter. When they die, they're going to die and cease to exist just like uh, all other animals. Uh, animals, insects, birds, uh, whatever, die, they're, they're gone. But 
Uh, that's the second point. There are some people who consist of matter. The third point, there are some people, though, uh, namely the Gnostics themselves, who have something else going for them. They're not just matter. They have a spark of the divine within them, a spark of the divine that had become entrapped in this world of matter. Fourth, they had become entrapped because of the nefarious workings of the creator of this world. The creator of this world was not the true God. Instead, he was an ignorant and far less powerful being who is intent on bringing harm to the divine realm. Gnostics believed that the divine realm consisted of lots of deities. The ultimate God was pure spirit. Other deities had descended from this one uh, pure, the other deities descend from this one spiritual being. There's this one being who turns out to be the creator of this world, in fact, who's not a good divine being at all. He's a lesser and uh, lesser uh, being, both in power and in knowledge. This lesser divine being had captured another divinity and had created the material world in order to imprison her after dividing her up into a million pieces. These million pieces that are entrapped now in this world are in fact the sparks of the divine that are trapped in some human bodies. The goal of the Gnostic religion was to provide a way of escape from the material trappings of this world for these sparks to allow them to return to their original spiritual home. Escape could come only by acquiring the knowledge necessary for salvation. That's why these people are called Gnostics. The Greek word for knowledge is gnosis. The only way to acquire this knowledge was for a divine emissary to come down from the spiritual realm to instruct you on what you had to know. You had to know where you originally came from, what you actually were, how you got entrapped here, and how you could escape. That's the knowledge that could come only from above. You couldn't look around at the world and figure it out. This is supernatural knowledge. Only a divine emissary could come down and reveal that knowledge to you. It's secret knowledge. It's not for everybody. It's only for people who have the sparks within them. Those who learn the knowledge then can pass it on once, once they've been given it. Christ, for these people, represented the divine being who came to earth to teach the truth that could lead to salvation. Salvation, then, came to those who understood the secret, uh, the secret meanings of Christ's words. And so that's what the Gnostic system is all about, revealing the truth that allows the divine sparks within to escape the material trappings of this world. Scholars continue to debate whether or not the Gospel of Thomas is best seen as a Gnostic Gospel or not. On the one hand, the book does not spell out the Gnostic myth of creation and redemption. It doesn't go through the myth and time to explain what the system is. But then again, neither do a lot of other Gnostic texts. And a large number of the sayings that may strike a first-time reader as altogether puzzling do, in fact, make good sense when read in light of the basic Gnostic myth that I've just laid out. For example, many of these sayings reflect the notion that within the hearer is a spark of the divine that had a heavenly origin, but has tragically fallen into the material world where it has become entrapped in a body or, uh, as it sometimes states, sunk into poverty. For example, uh, earlier I read saying number 29, which says, if the flesh came into being because of spirit, it's a wonder. Well, it is. It's an amazing that this material world, the flesh came into being because of spirit to entrap the spirit. That's a wonder. But if spirit came into being because of the body, it's a wonder of wonders. In other words, that, that's beyond possibility that the spiritual world came into being because of the material world. It was the other way around. Indeed, he says, I'm amazed at how this great wealth, 
has made its home in this poverty. It's amazing how this great wealth, the spark, has made its home in this poverty, the material body. If you understand the basic Gnostic myth, then the saying all of a sudden makes some sense. Or a uh, saying number 37, this one about when will you be revealed to us and when shall we see you, the disciples ask. And Jesus says that when you disrobe without being ashamed and take up your garments and place them under your feet like children and trample on them, then you will see the Son of the Living One and not be afraid. He's talking about uh, escaping the material body. The uh, body is likened to clothes that you rip off and trample on as of no use to you. You need to escape the material trappings of the body if you want the spark to escape to return to its original home. According to the sayings in this book, this spark is set free by learning the truth about this material world and the impoverished physical body that it inhabits. And it's Jesus who conveys this truth. It's the sayings of Jesus that can provide the, the uh, meaning that leads to eternal life. It's striking that there's not a word in this gospel about Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. What matters to this author is not that Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead. That's irrelevant for salvation for this author. What matters are Jesus' secret teachings, which alone can bring salvation from this impoverished existence. This, this author, in other words, stands starkly against what traditional Christian theology has taught about the importance of Jesus' death and resurrection. For him, that's, a, uh, that's irrelevant. What matters are the secret teachings of Jesus. One question of perennial debate among scholars is whether the Gospel of Thomas used the New Testament Gospels as, any of, as some of its sources for the sayings of Jesus. Thomas does have sayings, as we've seen, that sound remarkably like those found in the New Testament, and so maybe he did have the New Testament Gospels available. On the other hand, there are virtually no extensive verbal parallels in the, uh, in the sayings of Thomas with the New Testament. If you compare them, even when you take the Coptic and retranslate it back into Greek and then compare it with the Gospels of the New Testament, just, there are not extensive verbal parallels parallels that you would expect if one author was using the other author as a source for his material. Moreover, if Thomas were using the uh, Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which he has most similarities to, we'd be hard-pressed to explain why he left out most of their sayings of Jesus, many of which would seem to, be, to, seem to have been relevant to his agenda. Most scholars have concluded on these grounds uh, although it continues to be debated. But most scholars have concluded that this pseudonymous author knew a number of the sayings of Jesus and that he understood these sayings in a particular way based on his knowledge of what I've called the Gnostic myth. He evidently had heard these sayings much as the other gospel writers had through the oral traditions that were circulating about Jesus. In other words, he had heard the same sayings that Mark had heard and that Luke had heard. Because of the strong Gnostic leanings of some of these sayings, it seems to the majority of scholars that, uh, that this author, it seems unlikely that this author was writing already in the first century. We know about Gnosticism having developed into the second century. We, we don't have hard evidence of it existing in the first century. For this reason, most scholars maintain that this author produced the book during a period when Gnosticism was beginning to appear sometime early in the second century. In conclusion, the Coptic Gospel of Thomas is a significant discovery of the 20th century. If it had not been for the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls about a year and a half after the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library, everybody would be talking about Nag Hammadi instead of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, this is, this is the second most important archaeological discovery for biblical studies. And the Gospel of Thomas is the most important document found in this collection. Uh, this Gospel, the Gospel of Thomas, contains 114 sayings of Jesus. Some of them appear similar to those that are found in the canonical Gospels, others were previously unknown. It seems that this author understood Jesus in a Gnostic sense as the one who would deliver the secret knowledge that could bring salvation. He does not appear to have used the other Gospels as his sources, but 
he learned the sayings of Jesus uh, from oral traditions that were still alive in his community in the second century. Since, though, he appears to have written independently of the other Gospels, as we'll see in subsequent lectures, his account of Jesus' words, especially those that are not heavily influenced by the later Gnostic myth, can be of some use to us in deciding what Jesus himself actually said.